Bada bing, bada boom. Today's case is about Michelle, Shelley, Lynn, Watson, Rivardo, Long, Knotek. I just had to get that out the way. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so this woman, Michelle, Shelley, Lynn, Watson, Rivardo, Long, Knotek, was arrested in 2004. And so much has been going on in my brain because of this. So she gets arrested. She's a suspected serial killer. She is someone who has tortured her three daughters, I mean, to the brink of insanity, to the brink of suicide. And the way that she tortures these kids is so humiliating, is so psychological, and it's just so disgusting. And there is so many questions. How did she even end up like this? What is going on? And why is she being released next year from prison? What's going on with that? This all started in my brain because Amazon was trying to sell me a book for the past week. I don't know what it was. They said, you've got to buy it. Jeff Bezos' life depends on this one sale. They were pushing it down my throat. And finally, I decided, you know what? I'm just going to get it. So I got this book. I had no idea what I was getting into. I thought that this was going to be like a casual nighttime read not something that would be research for a podcast i i thought it was about sisterhood that's kind of what i got out of it you thought the, it was a wholesome family relationship well, no i know that there's like you know crime committed there was maybe one murder committed uh-huh. i didn't know it was a full-on serial killer i didn't know that it was this torturous i mean it just gets so crazy so the book is titled if you tell by greg olson and it is such a good book i mean i just like breezed through this there is so much in there about this family and i'm just gonna jump right in i'm gonna drop you off in the middle of this and it all takes place Wow, what a what a name. Okay. Battleground Washington. The fact that this story starts in Battleground Washington is gonna be crazy. It all starts with Emily. Now, this is a fake name because her identity is being somewhat protected by a lot of people and for good reason. So Emily, she had just graduated high school and she starts working at the local bowling alley. Now, for small towns like this, I mean the bowling alley is the it place to be. This is where everybody comes. Every weekend there's a bowling leagues. This is where everybody gathers. This bowling alley was owned by none other than les watson you could kind of call him the big shot in town mr big shots that's what they called him the him and his family they operated nursing homes but they also owned this massive bowling alley right so she starts working there fresh out of high school saving money for college and she runs into her boss les now les i mean he's got all the money in the world he's the president of chamber of commerce and he's a massive playboy he's 29 by the way She's 18 and he tells her, hey, I'm 22, so I can relate to I'm a lot 22 of 22 <laughs> and I'm the head of <laughs> the, uh, the president of Chamber of Commerce. You know, <laughs> I, you get a lot done, you know, when, by the time you're 22 and I just relate to you and I just I want to date you. And he starts smooth talking her and she immediately falls for him. I mean, Ignore the red flags that he has a first wife and three children that he completely abandoned in the state of California and ignore the fact that his mom is an absolute evil woman who is known for treating her employees like utter shit. There have been reports, there have been rumors that his mom would actually go around stuffing employees heads into toilets and flushing water into their heads because she didn't like their performance. Wait, so what happens? Does that drown you? I mean, I guess. I don't think it would be as um, intense of a drowning as if maybe you were to just stick your head into like a still body of water because it's moving and maybe not. I I don't know. Maybe it would drown you. Yeah, that's so odd. So she would keep doing that. So these are, you know, massive red flags. But she's 18. He's such a smooth talker. So she ends up getting married to the guy. It's just a small wedding. I mean, she didn't even know his real age until after the wedding. She didn't know what kind of monster in law that she really was going to have to deal with. And then the next bomb dropped on little high school graduated Emily. Okay, the day after the wedding, the phone rings. It's his first wife calling. And she says, take the kids. When are you going to come take the kids? What? So she hangs up and she's like, hey, babe, husband that I just married. Oh, what does your first wife mean by take the kids? I mean, that it must be miscommunication, right? No, he had promised the first wife, hey, just let me get married to this new girl and I will take the kids from California and I'll just have this new girl raise them. I'll just have this 18 year old raise my kids now. 
So, of course, I mean, Emily, being this amazing, sweet person that she is, she was like, well, I guess that I can't really say no, you know, especially because the ex-wife, she was on drugs. She was on a lot of she was an alcoholic. There was just a lot going on. So for the sake of the kids. OK, fine. Let's move them from California and straight into this newlywed house. So we've got Michelle, otherwise known as Shelly, who is six years old. She is going to be the star of today's story. Michelle, Shelly, Lynn, Watson, Rivardo, Long, Knotek. Yeah, that's Michelle. And then we've got a three-year-old named Chuck and then Paul, who is an, um, an infant that decided to stay with the mom. So the mom, the ex-wife is taking care of the infant for now. Later, uh-huh. they're going to get Paul, too. So now they have the six-year-old and the three-year-old. Imagine being 18, getting married, and now you're watching two kids. Like, what? what is happening? And immediately, you know, Emily's staying home with Shelly and Chuck, and she's noticing some strange things. So Shelly and Chuck had a strange relationship. Chuck wouldn't talk. Like, no matter how much Emily tried to ask Chuck a question, Shelly would talk for him. She would butt in. She would answer the question before Chuck could even say a word. So it was it it was like she was completely in control of her younger brother. It was really intense. Shelly would also tell Emily every single day without without missing a beat. I hate you. I really hate you. Every single day without a fail, she would tell Emily, good morning. I hate you. I mean, what would you do if you're Emily? I'm thinking I'd probably call that first wife back and be like, uh, how did you raise this demon child? What's going on? Well, that would be impossible because she just dropped off the face of the earth. She stopped calling. She didn't send any Christmas cards. I mean, for the next seven years, radio silence, absolutely nothing from the first wife. And then the couple with the Watsons, they get a call. LAPD says, hey, uh, I heard that you guys are like the next of kin. You need to come pick up this infant. Well, now no longer an infant, the seven year old Paul. Because the mom's dead. She's been murdered in L.A. Murdered? Yeah, she's been brutally beaten in a motel room. Murdered. So they're like, oh my God. You know, now at this point, Shelly is 13 years old. Chuck is 10. You get it. And they're they're so young now. They got to go get Paul. So they bring home Paul and they sit down all the kids and they tell them the bad news. Now, Shelly, who's 13, does not give a flying fork. Like she didn't care. There was no tear. There was no, what happened? Are we going to catch the murderer? Like none of that. She was just like, okay, did I mention that I hate you, Emily? Like, that was it. Yeah, just straight up. Like, did I mention I despise you? (laughs) I mean, they probably don't even remember their birth birth mom mom at this point, right? Now, now they have three kids and they were trying to have kids of their own. Total, it will be five kids. They will have Shelly, Chuck, Paul, and then two kids of their own. And Paul was just an absolute handful. He was so stubborn. He had no social skills up until this point. If he was hungry, he would climb onto the kitchen counters, open every single cabinet and just look through the food. If it doesn't pass his test, if he's not trying to eat it, guess where it goes? Toss to the ground. (laughs) <laughs> I, would, I would go crazy <laughs> Chuck, as a seven-year-old as a seven-year-old That's crazy. yeah and then the neighbors started coming to emily being like hey uh is something wrong with your kids because i've been noticing some strange stuff what do you mean well chuck the the middle kid he would just stand in his room with the window open looking out at the street just crying just standing still crying all the time do you guys hear that what so you think the three kids have gone through intense abuse i think that they went through intense abuse and then i think shelly was continuing to abuse the rest of the siblings because it becomes evident later i mean it's the strangest thing shelly the sister yeah the oldest sister so somehow the family tries so hard to manage to make this work you know they keep going on tons of vacations as a family if we can just if we can just patch it up with a ski trip if we can just go boating in washington maybe maybe we'll be a normal family and honestly it would have been really happy if it wasn't for shelly because if this trip was not shelly's idea it wasn't good enough she's one of those people that loves korean barbecue but if she's not the one that said hey let's get barbecue tonight she'd be like that's freaking stupid why would we get barbecue tonight do you know what i'm talking about like those types of people and she hated when her other siblings got any attention her way of dealing with it is not yelling is not you know punching anyone she would stuff tiny pieces of broken glass into the shoes of her siblings jeez this was her favorite activity And everything that she did was super cunning. She would pretend to help you 
but her intention was to hurt you. So she would say, Emily, well, let me do the dishes for you. You know, you cook so much today. I would love to do the dishes for you. So Emily being like, wow, she's really turning it around. Okay, do the dishes. So sweet. When you're not looking, Shelly would just throw away all the unwashed plates, all the utensils, pots and pans into the garbage and just walk away. (laughs) So you would (laughs) take out the trash, open it up. Guess what? It's the dinner plates. Some of them even broken because she had offered to do the dishes and you believed her. I mean, why even offer? Nobody asked her to do the dishes. It wasn't like it was a chore. She offered, you know, and if she felt like she was being nice and productive, she would just wipe the dishes with a cloth and not wash them and put them back. And if you confronted her, she'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) That's disgusting. That's not me. She would go up to her neighbors and say, hey, I love babysitting. I love babies. I love kids. Why don't I babysit for you? And I'll even do it for free. That's how much fun I have babysitting. And then throws and the baby <laughs> <into> <laughs> throws the, the babies can. away. Yeah. <laughs> and so the neighbors are like, this is this is the golden child of this neighborhood. Yeah. Watch our kids. Let's go on date night. So they come home. Shelly's like, well, they're doing good. They're in their bedroom. And she leaves. They go to their bedroom and the kids are terrified in their bed, just in their day close shivering in bed so they're like what happened why are you so scared what's going on why are you guys crying and they would say well Shelly barricaded us into our rooms wouldn't let us out locked us in here and just watched tv and ate food (sighs) and then she just left so i mean how old is she she's like 15 i just don't understand why even watch these kids why even offer to do it for free it's not i mean i would maybe get it if she's getting paid uh-huh. She's like, I want the money, but I don't want the work. See, I don't get it. What is it, this mentality? Either she's like purposefully trying to stir some shit up, like <laughs> trying to make things worse for people, or she's trying to do good, but she can function how to properly help people or she, do things. She seems like the person that hates to be good, but wants everyone to think that she is like this um, oh. angel, you know, and okay. it just doesn't connect in her head that she is making herself out to be an evil person okay. because later her nickname by the neighborhood is a uh, psycho Shelly. So that's never a good <laughs> nickname. I'm just saying. So at this point, like I said, Shelly is 15 years old during school hours. She decides, you know what? I just don't want to go home today. She goes to her counselor, sits down and with a very, very sad face tells her, I just can't do it anymore. You know? I just can't go home anymore. And so they rush her to CPS. And when she doesn't come home, you know, the parents, they don't get a call. Emily starts freaking out. She calls the school and they're super cold. They say, well, she's at a juvenile detention center. No, I can't say why. I can't say anything else. That's all I know. And they hang up on the mom. They hang up on the stepmom, Emily. So they rush to this center because, I mean, she probably stole something. Did she do something? Did she mess up? Like, how is she at a juvenile detention center? And so they start talking to the superintendent and they're like, listen, if she stole something, I'm sure we can pay for it. I'm sure there's a solution. Let me just talk to Shelly. Let me just see what kind of trouble she's in. Well, no, you can't talk to Shelly because, Mr. Watson, we've been told by Shelly that you're raping her. (laughs) And so he's like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, so this is a criminal investigation. You will have no contact with your daughter. That's it. Goodbye. So they send the couple home and they're freaking out. I mean, they had a doctor ordered to examine her, which honestly, I don't know. Is that even like a thing? So they were looking for her hymen being intact. They weren't looking for vaginal tearing. I'm sure that they were, but they didn't find any. Right. And so they had a doctor ordered to examine her. And meanwhile, they weren't allowed to see her. So they go home. They're shaken up. I mean, what, what do you do about this type of thing? Now, Emily tries to comfort him and is like, she probably doesn't even know what that word is. She probably just said it. This is miscommunication. Don't worry, Liz. We're going to get to the bottom of it. So they start going through her so, room. So the yeah. question is, they are innocent. They were saying the parents are definitely innocent. So it seems like it. It seems like um, it's, the rest of Shelly's life will kind of show that she is in a habit of lying a lot. Mm. And it doesn't seem to be any evidence by the doctor or by any criminal investigator that there was rape. Mm. Because they go into her room and they start searching and it's stuffed in between her mattress. They find a magazine called True Confessions. And the cover said, I was raped at 15 by my dad. So they flip to that story and the story she was telling was almost the same as the one in the magazine mm. that she had doggy eared. The parents just found that easily? Yeah. 
So they're like, there, I mean, there's no way that this is true. That's what they keep thinking. So the doctors, they go and examine her and the girl had um, no vaginal tearing. She had her hymen intact, which honestly doesn't mean anything. But in this case, they used it as something and um, they release her on one condition. She needs counseling. So now the doctors and the juvenile center is saying, hey, we believe you guys didn't rape her. But like she needs serious help because this is a big accusation. This is this is serious. So she gets kicked out of her school. They don't want anything to do with her. And these parents, they have money now. Right. So they're trying every local school like, please take our child. Here's all this money. Oh, no, no, no. We heard about what she did. No, no, no. no, Thank you. So eventually she starts bouncing around from different schools. They enlist her in a boarding school and even these very strict nuns who are known for you know knocking some discipline into a lot of children they didn't want her they're like you need to take her back this this kid's crazy we can't do this my grandma's catholic so i've been around a couple of nuns they're intense wonderful people but they're very disciplined and they're very you know hard they're like yes we're gonna we're gonna get to the bottom of this right but uh yeah they could not they they didn't even want to deal with her and you think all these came from the early age See, I think so. And I think maybe it has to do with the fact that Shelly was really close with her grandma once she started moving in with the dad's family. Now, Anna Watson, the grandma, is the toilet flusher. So maybe that kind of rubbed off. So Anna likes the grandma. Yeah. Or no, Shelly likes the grandma. They get along oh, really okay. well. Some people so say Shelley maybe likes, even a protege. So Shelly never say, Grandma, I hate you. No. Only to the mom. Yeah, only to the stepmom, yeah. She's like, Grandma, I love you. They love spending time together. Oh, wow. The grandma never really yelled at Shelly, yelled at everybody else. Never really yelled at Shelly. So maybe the grandma trained her. Maybe she had it in her. Or maybe it was just like this complicated mess of all of these things. Mm-hmm. And so she just started going crazy. Now, after she gets kicked out of all of these schools, Shelly left Emily and was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to go live with my aunt and uncle. So she moves in with them. And soon after, they get divorced, the aunt and the uncle. And a lot of people suspect that Shelly had something to do with this. I mean, she's known for tearing people apart and like planting these seeds and manipulating people. It just made sense. I mean, they were in such a happy relationship prior to taking in Shelly. So that was fine for Shelly because she had just met her future husband, a Randy Rivardo. So she's 17 and she was Okay, Shelly's beautiful, and I think that's what makes this story even more intense. She does not look like your normal sense of a torturer. She doesn't look like this crazy, toothless mom that just, like, hits her kids. Like, yeah, I'm a serial killer, right? She's so pretty. I mean, she's got this natural red hair. She's got this beautiful face, like, flawless skin. I mean, she is pretty on the outside. So all the local boys wanted to date her. She meets Randy, who's got these dark eyes, dark hair, and they just look like a magazine couple. So they start dating. And eventually Shelly is like, well, I've got to go back home because my aunt and uncle divorced. You know, I got to go back home with my parents. I'm going to work at my dad's nursing home. Why don't you come, Randy? My dad can give you a job. What do you think about that? Not only will he give you a job, but he's going to give you a rent free apartment. I know that you've been trying to save for college. So this could be the perfect opportunity. You would save so much money. And he's thinking, wow, this is too good to be true. I mean, you would think that your girlfriend's dad would hate you. He doesn't want to meet you. He doesn't want you around, you know, his precious daughter. What the heck? But but I do need the money. So he Mm -hmm. packs up his car. He drives and he meets the Watson family. And of course, they had other plans. The minute that they heard about Randy, they were all preparing for a wedding because they wanted to get rid of Shelly. Like, let's be honest. (laughs) They were just like, we just need her to be somebody else's responsibility. We can't do this anymore. So once he gets there, the plan is in motion. He did feel a little bit strange. You know, that Les was too welcoming. It's, I mean, usually they want to question the boyfriend, but he's just like, oh, man, you're the perfect fellow. Come in here. Put on my suit jacket. That would that looks like wedding attire. <laughs> you would, you would, have you ever thought about being a groom one day? Like he was just doing the most. So the wedding rolls around and none of Randy's family show up. Did they see Shelly's true side before Randy did? No, because Shelly forgot to mail the invites. Quote unquote forgot. So it was just a wedding with Shelly's family (laughs) and Randy. And he's like, my family is not here. Oh, yeah. I might have forgotten to mail those invites out. Um, Okay. This is so Um, strange. So, (laughs) yeah. So their whole wedding is dependent on that little 
paper invite huh? pretty much yeah okay and so the parents you know the watsons they give them the newlywed couple a free trailer to live in and you would think that shelly would be like wow this is amazing thank you so much no she hated it she said it's disgusting she kept whining why do i have to live here and on top of that her dad had to fire her because she had such bad performance imagine how shitty of an employee you have to be for your own father to fire you Mm -hmm. It was really bad, right? So now she's jobless, unemployed, living in this trailer. She's complaining that she doesn't have to pay rent for this trailer because it's not nice enough. And she started demanding for a new car. She said, Mom, Dad, I want a Volkswagen Beetle. The one Ted Bundy drove. I want one of those because I, I'm just as nasty. Um, shout out to all the people that actually drive Volkswagen Beetles. I think they're super cute. Anyways, so he tried to get her one, but he couldn't get his hands on one or maybe it was too expensive. So he ended up getting her a pink Buick convertible instead. So he drives it up to the trailer. I mean, it was nearly brand new and who, it was beautiful. This? The dad, the Aww. dad just does everything for her. Right. And she immediately sees this car and she starts screaming. This. I want the pink Lamborghini, <laughs> not the blue one. Yes. <laughs> she starts screaming this is a horrible old maid's car what the f dad i don't say this often but when i do just know that i really mean it i am enjoying wearing a pair of jeans normally i think jeans are super uncomfortable and they're not breathable but i have recently found a pair that has told me different it is everlane jeans right and if you guys haven't heard about everlane they have premium quality essentials that complement every single wardrobe at a more transparent and affordable price and when i tell you that these jeans were so affordable but so comfortable they fit in a way that just hugs my body and every time that i sit up or stand up i never have to do that weird wiggly thing that you have to do when you're wearing jeans to stretch your legs again because i think everlane has quality clothing with ethical factories and they also have radically transparent pricing since 2010 they do extensive research as a company to vet and use ethical factories that provide fair wages and reasonable hours to the skilled people who craft your clothing timeless designs and finest sustainable materials so you can wear them for years and the coolest thing is that most retailers they hide their markups but but Everlane believes their customers have the right to know how much their clothes cost to make. In fact, they will share with you how much their products cost to produce at each stage of production. Whether you guys are looking for an upgrade to your spring uniform or you're going out on town with your friends, having a movie night from workout to takeout, swimwear to trackwear, they have styles for everything from lounging at home to hitting up your favorite late night spot. If you guys are looking for the perfect pants, Everlane's denim stays comfortable and versatile all year long. So they have skinny jeans, relaxed jeans, slim, athletic. You can find the perfect cut that fits to your form just right. You can even choose your stretch level. So they have vintage style, rigid, original with just a hint, or body hugging, authentic stretch. I love the body hugging one. And it's all made from certified organic cotton at the world's cleanest denim factory with zero landfill waste, which is amazing. Now, the best part is that you can try all of these on and they accept returns within 30 days of the ship date. And all uniform clothing comes with a 300 165 day guarantee which is insane so go to everlane.com slash rotten and sign up for 10 percent off of your first order plus free shipping and get easy returns within 30 days of your ship date that's 10 percent off your first order when you go to everlane.com slash rotten and sign up And so that night, Shelly goes into her trailer after seeing her pink Buick convertible, not up to standard, not up to par, and she overdoses on allegedly sleeping pills and alcohol. So Randy comes home and he can't wake her up. So he's shaking her. He's freaking out. Why won't you wake up? He calls the parents over. They rush her to the hospital. The doctors in the ER, they pump her stomach and they come out to tell the parents um, the contents in her stomach she had only taken a very insignificant small amount of aspirin. There were no sleeping pills. There was no alcohol. So she just she just refused to get up? So she was faking it. So <sighs> she took fucking two Tylenol and said, yeah, this is it. I'm just going to pretend to be dead. I'm alive. But I'm dead. And so the parents were like, what? She, wh no, she wouldn't wake up. Yeah, no, very insignificant small amount of aspirin. Thank you. Have you guys tried... Um <laughs> 
tickling her yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah like you really couldn't get her up what's going on and so the parents they confront her and she told them that the er doctors are dumb as hell and it was sleeping pills okay <laughs> and she's like it was sleeping pills and i almost lost my life what are you talking about so once she decided that the car was not great enough, she decided that the trailer was not good enough. So she has this new plan, right? A couple weeks later, Randy comes home from school. The trailer is completely ransacked and Shelly's face is all bloodied up. And he's like, oh my God, oh my God, what's happened? Why do you look like this? What's going on? Did someone hurt you? And she says, this man came in, he attacked me and he raped me. He took your rifle and he ran off. I don't know what to do. So they call the police, they call the family over and the sheriff questioned her for quite some time by her Herself. And when he came back out, he told the family, I don't know what to tell you, but her wounds are self-inflicted and she just fessed up that n- there was no man. So, I mean, I'm not going to press charges for this fake police report, but y'all got to do something about it. So he leaves and the family again presents her with the truth. They say, hey, uh, love you to death, Shells, but that sheriff just told us that you agreed that you lied, that these are self-inflicted wounds. And she's like, absolutely not, Dad. You don't understand. It's too dangerous for me here. I have to live in town. I have to live in a house. A trailer is too dangerous for a woman like me. And they agreed. They put her in a house. So after all of this, after all of this shenanigans, Randy is still staying with her, okay? The rest of the family is still trying to support her. She gets pregnant and this was this is a lot of mixed feelings from everyone because first of all she is not maternal she's a shit show her life is a shit show but maybe this could change her personality i feel like we all know that one person that like drastically changed once they became a parent maybe that's shelly so Randy's parents, they get a call. Oh my God, you guys are going to have your first kid together. They get so excited and they, they didn't know this dark side of Shelly. So they're like, yes, we're going to bring the whole family. We're going to visit you guys. We're going to bring all these gifts. And once they come, Shelly refused to leave the bedroom. She did not even say hi to them. She refused to even see them once. She just didn't care. I don't want them here. What? And so they left without seeing her. Randy was super embarrassed. And then once they left, all of the gifts mysteriously went missing. Wait, what does that mean? All of the baby gifts that they brought just mysteriously went missing. It seems like Shelly probably trashed trashed it. Wait, after they left? Yeah. She trashed all the gifts? Or did the family took the gift back home? No, the family was like, that's so strange. We put it there. Shelly okay, trashed so it all. So she doesn't like free stuff either. So she doesn't like free stuff. But most importantly, I think that she doesn't like Randy being close to anyone but her. You know, doesn't want him to be involved with his family. Doesn't want her child to be like, oh, that's from grandma and grandpa, right? Like everything had to be Shelly, 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 Shelly. And she just didn't like it. She didn't like the idea of her her kid getting presents from someone else that wasn't her, mm. which is crazy, right? And so um, this was a whole problem. Randy was confused by it. And then Randy gets a call from his sister. And she's like, hey, I left my sweater there. Do you mind shipping it back or like holding it for me? Just just don't throw it away. It's my sweater, right? And she, Shelly, she's like, I can do it i can i can ship the sweater wow thank you you're just such such a wonderful wife so she ships the sweater and the sister receives it in the mail the outside packaging the box pristine condition opens it up and her sweater has been completely shredded with a pair of scissors and she asked do you know anything about this randy shelly and shelly says oh my god must have been the postman I don't get like her behavior is the oddest thing I've ever heard. Bizarre. It's like something that you would see a five year old do. Yeah. And then you see those videos that parents holding the camera. Did you eat a candy? <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, No, I didn't. <laughs> and their face is covered in chocolate. But it's not even just no, I didn't. They have like a logical reason. Exactly. They're like, No, I didn't. It was the cat and the yeah. dog who ate it. And this chocolate on my face is actually doo doo. <laughs> and you're like, No, it's not. <laughs> right like yeah. so they say kids do that because they can't think of yes. the reasoning and the yeah. consequences yet but it seems like she still behaves that way right still crazy so at this point her marriage is starting to fall apart when she gives birth to their first daughter nikki right she demands that he give her all of his checks right away you know shelly is like you you can't have your paychecks anymore you're gonna give it immediately to me you don't sleep inside the house anymore he would start sleeping inside of his car and it just got so bad to the point that even though randy loved his new daughter his newborn baby nikki he just couldn't take it anymore he had to leave he he felt so trapped and shelly was so evil so he leaves and she is immediately 
a wreck. She opens up every single credit card that she could under their joint account before he cut her off and then put him into debt. Just bought everything in sight, not even stuff that she wanted, just anything and then randomly one day she drops off nikki with grandma emily and then just leaves she like drops off the face of the earth just one full year gone not a word of where she went nothing but didn't the husband leave too yeah so now she's gone too maybe she's doing some soul searching maybe she's dating somebody else and then she came up to pick up nikki just a year later never explained where she went and was like where's my kid thanks bye and took her kid and nobody knew where she went? Nobody knew. So she starts telling Nikki, you know, Nikki's getting to the age where she can talk, she can walk, and she's probably wondering, hey, what happened to, do I have a dad? What's going on over there, right? And she would tell her daughter, your dad abandoned us, and your grandparents hate you. They wanted you gone. They kicked you out of their house. But it's okay, Nikki, because I love you so much. Anytime the dad, Randy, and the rest of his family would send notes for her birthday or would send gift cards or would send presents, she would swap out the tags, write her name on it, and present it to Nikki as if she saved up all this money being a single mom to buy her these amazing gifts. So Nikki was like, oh my God, I've got the best mom ever. She does everything for me. So at 24 years old, Shelly goes into her second marriage to a man by the name of Danny Long, and they immediately get pregnant and give birth to another baby girl by the name of Samantha. But Everyone calls her Sammy, right? She's this beautiful girl. She's got this blonde hair with these big, big eyes. And uh, would we say that Shelly's a good mom? Well, she really wanted to pretend to be. So all day she would sit and watch TV on the couch. And when anyone would come over or when, you know, Danny would come home from work, she would pop up out of nowhere, grab the baby and act like she's so tired. Act like she had been carrying this baby nonstop all day. She couldn't even put the baby down because all the baby would do would cry if she put the baby down, right? But there were signs of that lie. There were dirty diapers everywhere. There was bottles laying all over the crib. Sammy would constantly have these really intense diaper rashes, but she still would try to convince everyone, no, 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 no. I carried her all day. I didn't put her down. I didn't do any of that. No way. So she just like went out of her way to tell everyone I'm the best mom ever when nobody was asking. Nobody cared. So the fighting with Danny starts getting worse. It seems to be a trend. She ends up having a kid and then the fighting escalates. So with her second husband, it seemed that he stood his ground a lot better than Shelly's family or his ex-husband. I mean, there would be dishes breaking for every fight. Like every time that they would yell at each other, plates would be thrown. There would be holes punched into the drywall of their house. So finally, after five years, they get a divorce. Now, this is when Shelly starts dating a bunch of dudes, right? She's got one boy here, one boy there, and she would tell her two kids the same thing every single time. This is your new dad. Call him dad. She'd be dating a guy for like a week, and she'd bring him home and be be like, this is your new dad, Kevin. Call him dad. Every single year that they were enrolled into school, they had a new last name. It was just always the last name of the new boyfriend that she was dating. Not legally. No one questioned it. She would just write the new dude's last name on there insane now around this time nikki remembered something incredibly strange happened to her she was sleeping when all of a sudden she wakes up and she couldn't breathe there was a pillow on her face and she starts screaming i mean she's a young kid she's like i don't know what's going on right she starts screaming and then she's trying to like focus her vision the pillow lifts from her face she's still crying and she looks up and her mom is just looking at her and she says what is it baby what's wrong Someone put a pillow on my face, mom. No, it was just a dream. Just a bad dream. No, no, it wasn't a dream, mom. Like someone put a pillow on my face. They were like, they were trying to like suffocate me, mom. And the mom just stared at her and said, it was just a dream. And so for the next couple of years, this will be something that Nikki thinks about nonstop because there's just a lot of things that were strange about it. Her mom got there way too quickly. Her mom didn't rush into the room. Her mom was just there. And why did she have that like strange look on her face? She didn't look scared for her child. She didn't look concerned. It was almost like she looked intrigued, curious. So by the time Shelly is 29, she's got a new man in her life. And his name is Dave Kanotek. Yes, this is the last one to her very long list of last names, right? So she marries oh, Dave. that's how she yeah. got her long <laughs> name. So she, she actually keeps those names. I don't know. That's what she just went by. Just this really long name. I'm sure legally she didn't. Oh. 
Maybe she did. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. Okay. So Dave Kanotek, he was this military man. He lived in Washington and he was just a super simple guy. That's what everyone says about him. He's nice. He's athletic. He's got this gentle personality, a gentle giant, if you will. So one day he walks into the sore thumb bar. Yeah, that's the name of the bar, the sore thumb bar. And he sees one of the most beautiful girls that he has ever seen with her bright red hair all over the place. And he just, he had to do it. He drank up some courage, you know, multiple shots and finally asked her out and they immediately started dating. So just like the rest of her relationships, she quickly introduced him to her kids. Here's Nikki, here's Sammy. And he just felt like they needed a father figure. He wanted to be that for them. He wanted, now that he's met the kids, their relationship must be serious, right? And then he gets a phone call. Shelly calls him and says, I don't know what to do. I just went to a doctor's appointment and I, I don't know, I'm just trying to make ends meet right now, but I have cancer and I probably won't live for another year. I mean, Dave is devastated. He just met the woman of his dreams and now she has terminal cancer. She's going to die. What are we going to do? Right. And he just can't think. Of, he just can't stop thinking about, is this the timing? Is this what's meant to happen? Am I supposed to marry her? Because maybe these kids are my kids. Maybe that's why we met each other at this time, right before her diagnosis, because I'm supposed to be the father to these children. So he manned up and he married Shelly married her what yeah and their marriage almost immediately turned into a shit show dave was constantly being pushed to his literal breaking point any tiny little thing shelly would yell at him she would say you idiot i can't believe i married such an r word you disgust me you call yourself a man and he would sit out on the porch with a gun to his head sobbing for hours contemplating suicide and shelly would see this the kids would see this and she didn't do anything to stop it. She just kept going. And anytime he said, I can't do this anymore. I'm meeting my breaking point. Mentally, I'm not doing okay. She would say, well, this is how couples talk it out. And he'd be like, what? He was just terrified of being around his wife. Anything was a weapon. The spatula in the kitchen, the fishing pole, the electrical cord. I mean, she would straight up whip people with electrical cords. Shelly was practically nocturnal as well, which just added to the scariness of her entire aura, her entire vibe. So she would do this thing every single night. She wouldn't sleep. She would only sleep during the day when the kids were at school and her husband was at work. So all night she's oh laying on the gosh. couch. Just she's got, you know, she's laying, staring at the ceiling. The TV's on. Her palms are just folded on her chest. She's thinking about my husband's not home again. My daughters are peacefully sleeping upstairs. But for whatever reason, she just gets a little bit more angry every second of that long night. And it's just usually a small thing. Someone forgot to close the kitchen cabinet today. Who the fuck was it? And she just gets riled up and she keeps getting herself more and more angry. How dare they not close that kitchen cabinet? I could have been walking and hit my head on that kitchen cabinet. These ungrateful little shits. And she would just keep riling herself up. And then in the middle of the night, she would burst into the kids room, turn on the lights and scream, you fucking little bitch. And would start pushing them around. And they would just immediately start saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Nobody even knew what they were getting yelled at for. She never really told them. And she would just beat them up. And then she'd say, now go to sleep. And the next morning, it would be completely fine. She would just act like none of that happened. It's almost like Shelly wanted to psychologically mess with her own kids. So during one Christmas, the whole week before Christmas, Shelly locked Nikki, the eldest daughter, into her room. She wasn't allowed to come out the whole Christmas break. Like, yeah, you're out of school, but you can't come out to the living room. You, We're going to bring you little shitty food here, like probably two pieces of toast. You're going to pee in a bucket. That's it. Like, you're not allowed out of your room. She had no idea why she was getting this punishment, right? Then Christmas Day rolls around, and it's the most beautiful scene. A huge pile of presents in the living room nikki sammy merry christmas come downstairs open your presents and the two girls were like the happiest that they had ever been they're just opening all of these wonderful presents and it was the best day ever now the next day immediately shelly rips the presents from their hands and takes it away locks them into a closet with the rest of all of their presents and she would arrange things and put tiny pieces of tape on the door to make sure nobody snuck in to the closet to play with their toys 
I just don't get it. So she would spend this money that they really didn't have. They were not making a ton of money, right? She mm-hmm. was stay at home mom and um, Dave was not making good money. So she would spend all of this money to buy them presents, go through the trouble of wrapping it. They would open it. They'd be so excited. And then she would stuff them into a closet and torture them by never letting them play with it. Uh, so you think she spent the money just to torture them? It seems like it. She just wanted to give it to them and have that moment of like, oh my God, mom, you're the best person ever. And then she would just rip it from them. Oh, that is... And would never let them play again. And so another Christmas, Shelly gave these tiny little bear pins in their stockings and they start opening up all of their presents, which is usually a shit ton, like I said. And obviously, these tiny little bear pins could easily have been misplaced or maybe they were under a pile of, you know, massive wrapping paper. And Shelly just went off. You girls are the most selfish, ungrateful kids. I mean, she was fully unhinged. So they spent the entire Christmas looking all over the carpet for these little pins. And finally, after hours, they found them tucked inside another Christmas gift. There is no way that the girls would have hidden them there. It was hidden. It wasn't placed. It wasn't looked like it was thrown in there. It looked hidden inside of another present. And everyone knew it had to be Shelly. It Uh. had to have been Shelly who hid it. And her plan was that they were going to get a beating on Christmas Day. So they all got beat up on Christmas Day. Now, once they start going to school, it gets even weirder. Shelly would not let them shower for weeks at a time. All usage of the bathroom to even pee, to even poo, had to go through Shelly. I mean, it was so embarrassing for the kids because they would show up at school smelly and greasy and just, what, what is going on? If she did let her kids pee and poo, she would sit right next to them and watch them like they were some sort of science experiment. Like she would just stare at their face while they're trying to pee or poo. It's just the strangest thing. And it made people super uneasy. So a lot of the times the girls, they started peeing into bowls and throwing the pee out of their window and then hiding the bowl inside of their room. Because they just, even if their mom said yes, they would have to like stare at her while they peed. Yeah. It's just really confusing. Now the house itself was even more confusing because Shelly loved cute little knickknacks. She loved better butterfly teacups. She loved dusty rose wallpapers. So everything in the house was super pink, was super warm, was super just loving vibes. But she was just evil. And her number one target became Nikki, the eldest daughter. For whatever reason, Shelly decides, okay, I hate my child. And she started coming up with these inventive ways to torture Nikki. So there was something called wallowing. The main focus of wallowing was humiliation. In the middle of the night, she would wait till everyone is asleep. And she would rush into Nikki's room. And it was like an ambush. She would thrust open the door, turn on the lights, scream, get up, get up, close off, get the fork downstairs, you worthless piece of shit. Like she would just start yelling yelling in the middle of the night 3 a.m nikki is in deep sleep she would wake up super confused start crying and start taking off all of her clothes she would run downstairs where her mom would force her out into the backyard completely naked and she would say dave come downstairs and she would make nikki squat in the mud completely nude and dave would hose her down with ice cold water and she would say And Nikki would beg and Nikki would cry. And the mom would say, make her wallow. She's a pig, Dave. Teach her a lesson. More water. Wallow, wallow? Nikki. Meaning like Nikki was supposed to kind of move around in the dirt and just keep saying, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. She was forced to like squat and like move around in the dirt covered in this wet water and just say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like just beg for forgiveness for whatever, whatever mistake that she made. That she honestly had no idea. Shelly wouldn't even tell her most of the time. And then she, Shelly would drag her back into the bathroom, pour hot water into the tub, just straight up hot water, and plop Nikki in there, which this is a lot of pain to go from ice cold water, especially in the winter times, and then just to straight into hot water. And she would constantly say, you're a pig, Nikki. Now clean up and go to bed. Now, Sammy was never as badly abused because Sammy was kind of the funny one in the family. She was really good at handling her mom. She wouldn't fight back. So Nikki was someone that always tried to fight back. Like, what? why? Why? I didn't do anything wrong. Or, no, I didn't do that. Because sometimes Shelly would make up shit. And she'd be like, yeah, you did that. You hit, you hit my head. No, I didn't. So it was better to just be like, oh, I don't remember, but I'm sorry. <laughs> And that's kind of what Sammy did. And she was a great sweet talker. She was also really popular at school, Sammy. So maybe Shelly was worried that she had too many friends and would maybe want to tell one of them about this abuse. 
So this kind of feels like a personal attack, but um, here we go. Are you engaged and not sure how to make your wedding happen? <laughs> if you guys don't know, my fiance and I have been engaged for um. Oh, God, like something gnarly now. It's been insane. And you can join one million couples. We can join one million couples who have planned their wedding with Zola. Zola makes wedding planning easier and less stressful by creating everything couples need all in one place. So if you guys are looking for wedding vendors in your area, you can fast track your search for the right venue, photographer, and more. All of the vendors on Zola are pre-screened, so you can skip endless back and forth with the vendors who aren't right for you. They have a clutter-free experience with no ads. You can also save the date and invitations. They have hundreds of beautiful, affordable designs and just in case all purchases come with free change the dates get a feel for their paper before you even purchase because they have free personalized samples now you're thinking what about a wedding website that's important well you can actually create one for free the easiest way to share details and updates is through your wedding website you can actually host virtual events on it for free hundreds of beautiful designs to pick from and you can set it up within minutes and you're like, well, I still got to do a hard part. I got to build my registry. Well, Zola has the most fun and easy registry. You can fill your registry with gifts, cool experiences, cash funds, all in one place. And the cash funds can be used for anything. A puppy, a charity, a new home, whatever you want. Now, this is super cool. Wedding is stressful, okay? They have 24-7 access to support you won't find anywhere else. I'm talking an actual human advisor who really understands what it's like to plan a wedding. So go to Zola.com slash Rotten today and use promo code SAVE50, that's SAVE50, to get 50% off your save the dates. You can also get a free personalized paper samples before you purchase. That's Zola.com slash Rotten, promo code SAVE50. So while this is all happening at home, the Watsons, Shelly's parents, you know, Les and Grandma Emily, they thought that Shelly had changed. I mean, her stinky personality is still stinky, don't get me wrong, but maybe maybe she's a lot more like a mom now. Besides the two daughters, they never mentioned anything about the abuse. If anything, the two girls would only tell to their grandparents, yeah, mom's a little weird, which is kind of something everybody agreed on. Like, that's the very nicest word that you could say to describe Shelly. So everyone was like, yeah, mom is a little weird weird, right? So besides Shelly, the family had another person to worry about. Shelly's littlest brother, Paul, was the newest troublemaker in the family. He was in and out of prison. He had gotten um, his girlfriend pregnant, and now they have this son, Shane Watson, who's 13 years old, and he has nowhere to go. I mean, he's been abandoned by both of his parents, and Shelly decides, hey, why don't, why don't you guys let me take him in? I'm already raising, you know, kids around that age, so Nikki was 14, Shane is 13, and Sammy is 10, so it'd be perfect. They would go to the same school. Everything would be on par. What? So, I mean, okay, I guess if you want to raise him. So they take Shane in immediately, loved by the sisters. He had this goofy personality, and Shane immediately also started calling Dave and Shelly mom and dad. And the sisters felt like he was more of a brother than a cousin. So after about a week, it became very clear why Shelly wanted him there. It's not because she's this amazing person, okay? It's because every single morning she would come up with this mile-long list of all the things that he needed to do in the house. So most of the time, he spent it doing chores. He was terrified of Shelly. If he didn't do the best job or some small mistake happened, things inside of his room would start disappearing. So at first it was a pillow. Then it was his blanket. Eventually, his entire mattress and bed were gone and he was sleeping on the ground. He could <laughs> only wear oh, one set of clothes. So she took all of his clothes, which in the beginning, once he first moved into the, with them, he was kind of popular at school. He was like this new mysterious bad boy, you know, 13 bad boy. And now, now he's just this smelly kid and everyone hated him. What's, what happened? There was this massive transformation. So now he's wearing the same clothes every single day to school. So it seemed that Shelly hates Shane and Nikki. And so they kind of formed this alliance. They become super close. So they spend hours talking about how forked up Shelly is. And Nikki said that she knew by watching TV and other kids at school that her mom was different and that something wasn't right. But her mom could still be nice at times. And she said, and I quote, I loved my mother because I didn't know I had a choice. I had to love her. This is where it gets really bizarre. So once Shelly finds out how close they're getting, you would think, okay, maybe she doesn't want it. Let's think like we're evil, like we're Shelly, right? Maybe she wants to f destroy their bond, force them apart. The way she does it is so bizarre and really, really gross. She would force them out of their rooms in the middle of the night and she would demand them to take off their clothes in the living room. 
So they would take off all of their clothes, and once they're completely naked, they were forced to slow dance together. And sometimes、What? Dave would watch. Sometimes Sammy was forced to watch. And you know, Shane and Nikki, they would be crying the whole time because not only is it humiliating, but it's just utterly disgusting. I mean, these they really think of each other as brother and sister, and they、yeah. are cousins. So they're disgusted. They're humiliated. They're confused, and they would be crying. And she would constantly make them do this—this this weird, strange, naked slow dancing. And then the punishments on Shane got more and more bizarre. So nobody even remembers what she was super upset about, but she was yelling at Shane. And then she goes into her drawer, takes out duct tape and icy hot from the medicine cabinet, and undresses him completely. So he's naked, tapes his ankles and his wrists, made him stand straight in front of the front door, and applied icy hot on his penis. And Shane is like, you know, fourteen. He's yelling in pain, and the girls were forced to watch. It's it's really strange. So at thirty-four years old, Shelley becomes pregnant again. This was going to be their third kid. She was excited, and so was Dave, because Dave was like, "This is a miracle. Not only is she still alive, because she was supposed to die six years ago, but she's pregnant now, even with her cancer. This is crazy, amazing. It's a gift from God. Shelley is a gift from God." <sighs> So the couple is so excited, but Shelley's like, "Wait a minute! There's just too much to do around here. You know, Dave is working nonstop. He would do anything to stay awake at work. He took on multiple jobs. He slept in his car, and he never saw a penny of his paycheck. It all straight up went to Shelley. He had nothing. He would go to the food bank to get food for his lunch. That's it. Like Dave would sometimes live in a tent for like weeks on end. He had a miserable life." And so she was just taking all of his cash. She had the kids doing all of the work. So all of the night, all of the day, she would lay around on the couch watching crime shows, and she would scream random things. Like she'd be watching a、uh, mommy dearest or whatever, and she would say things like, "What kind of mom would do that to their kid?" And everyone's just like frozen. Like what? She would eat these candy bars and just stuff the wrappers between the couch cushions.、Oh, and she、no. would constantly think about new innovative ways to punish her kids. And she just needed help. That's just too much work for her to do. Crime shows, candy, and innovative, you know, punishments. That's a lot on her plate. So she decides to bring in her best friend by the name of Kathy Loreno. This is Shelley's best friend. She was a hairdresser and she was also a witness at the couple's wedding, or her and Dave's wedding, right? And she was going through a bit at home. Kathy was fighting with her family. She came from a rough background. Her family had recently kicked her out. So Shelley offered her, "Hey, I'll give you a free place to stay as long as you help me look after the baby, kind of like a midwife." At first, it seemed like a temporary thing, but it seemed that Shelley just did not want Kathy to leave. You know, Kathy's whole thing was, "Yeah, I'll do this for a while, and then once the baby gets a little bit more stable, I'll go find some work and I'll be out of your hair." And she would say, "No, no, no! You need to stay with us, Kathy. It'll be so fun. Plus, I really need you." And Kathy could not say no because she worshipped Shelley. She she just loved Shelley for whatever reason. She would even say things to Shelley's kids like, "Nobody works harder than your mom. I don't know why you guys can't do more." To help out, just constantly putting Shelley on a pedestal,、What? and probably during their entire friendship, she was manipulated. You know,、mm. Kathy believed that she was sick. Kathy believed that you know Shane and Nikki were just these troublemaking kids、mm. that were causing nothing but trouble for Shelley, who's just trying to be this amazing mom, but also is dying of cancer. You know, and like miracle pregnancy. And so Tori was born a week early. This is their third kid, right? So they're all half sisters, but they're really just like super strongly bonded later on, right? So Tori, the third daughter, she is born, and she's born a week early. But Shelly goes around telling everyone she's a preemie. She's a premature baby. She had so many health conditions. Oh my God, you wouldn't believe it. She had this heart condition that she needed to be watched nonstop. I couldn't. I couldn't even sleep a wink. You guys, I had to have this crib with this monitor attached, and these alarms would go. Off any time that she stopped breathing because she has heart problems, and I would have to rush in the middle of the night and I would have to pick her up. I'd have to do CPR. Oh, it was just so bad, right? This bed did exist. This alarm system did exist, and it really stressed out the kids because it would go off every single night. The kids would rush downstairs because you know these kids fell in love with Tori the minute that they saw her, their little sister. They would rush downstairs. Tori would have this red face, and the mom would be like, "It's okay. I saved her. I saved her." And they'd be like, "Oh, thank God, another close call, right?" Now, one night, Nikki she couldn't fall asleep because she was so worried. She's like, "Oh, any time now, the the alarms are gonna go off, and I I gotta rush downstairs." 
So she's like, you know what? I'm just going to go check on the kid. You know, I'm just going to go check on Tori. She's probably sleeping. And she rushes downstairs. The alarms had not gone off yet. And Shelly was standing over Tori's crib with a pillow on Tori's face. So Nikki's like, Mom? And for the first time ever, Shelly seemed incredibly startled. And just said, she's okay now. I'm just putting the pillow in the crib. And so from that point on, Nikki tried to look after Tori more because she remembered what happened to her when she was young. She saw this strange pillow incident happen again with Tori. I mean, it's just so strange. So the attention of having Tori kind of died down, you know, she grew out of this preemie phase, I guess. And now she's this healthy infant. And after a couple of months, everyone was done fawning over the infant. They were like, oh, yeah, OK, you've got a baby. Great. Amazing. She's wonderful. So she starts up another medical mystery. She calls up her stepmom, Emily, and says, it's been confirmed. What? Wait, wait what's going on, Shelly? What's confirmed? <sighs> I just got it confirmed today. I have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I'm getting treatment, but it's serious. What? what? Is that? It's just this really, really bad um, illness. And it's it's deadly. You know, she could die. Very A lot of people with lymphoma die. So she's like, okay, okay, well, what can I do? So the next day, Shelly calls back her stepmom and says, they were wrong. It's not lymphoma, but it's cancer. Okay. I mean, are they believing this, the family? So this is when Emily starts getting stressed out because she is now a nurse. You know, she's working in this medical field and she's thinking, how, do, how does a doctor make such a colossal mistake? Like, how do you go from lymphoma to cancer? This doctor should have their license revoked. Like, this is disgusting. And she's like, tell me what doctor you're seeing. Where are you getting your treatments? I can go with you, sweetie. Like, it's going to be hard, but I can be with you as support. And she said, no, 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 no. No, don't worry about it. I have my best friend, Kathy, she's here and she's taking care of me. Okay, um, well, just let me know if you need anything, okay? So this is when Emily starts investigating, right? Shelly's complaining, but she's really vague in her symptoms and her treatments. Shelly would call Emily nonstop to complain about her illness, but was so vague about it. Mm. Like, I just don't feel good today. Well, what's wrong? Everything, everything doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Like, what part? What, what type of symptom are you feeling? Just everything, okay? <laughs> And she's like, this is strange. So one day she's had it. She's on the phone with Shelly and she says, you know what? I'm sick of this cancer crap. OK, I think you're lying. And Shelly's like, what? Well, none of this is adding up. I know that you're lying. And Shelly immediately starts screaming, throws down the phone. Kathy picks it up and is like, you're really upsetting her. You know, this, I just don't think that this is a good conversation. And she's like, Kathy, you know that this is bullshit. You know that, right? You're being tricked. All of you guys are being tricked. This is when Dave comes over. Now he's taking over the phone and he's going off on Emily. What kind of mother are you? She's going through the fight of her life. And you could care less. And Are she's like, serious? okay, Dave, let me ask you something. Have you been with her? Have you been to the doctor's appointments with her? Have you looked at some of these treatment bills? Do they say chemo on there? What kind of treatment is she getting? Do you know? And he says, well, I drive her to the hospital every single week. And then what? Do you go inside? Have you talked to a doctor? No, I would never go inside. You know, Shelly's too prideful. She doesn't want me to see her at her weakest during treatment. <laughs> So she's like, what? You guys are all getting duped right now. But nobody believed Emily. They all believed Shelly. Nobody even looked for proof after. They just believed Shelly. I don't understand. S someone with that type of pattern of behavior? Yeah. They still believe this? Yeah. People who lie about having cancer is the strangest thing to me. Maybe it also feels dirty. Like, I can't imagine if maybe someone I loved had cancer and another person was like, oh, well, she's faking it. I don't think I could, I don't think I could bear it to even ask for proof. I would just feel like, oh, God, oh, yeah. God. Like, the chance that this person is wrong and this person does have cancer and I'm asking for proof right now, like, I, I would just feel like the shittiest person in the world. Maybe it's that, but eventually the tone of the house started to shift. 
Kathy was no longer loved by Shelly. Anything Kathy started doing was never good enough. And it was just something that she needed to be punished for. And it all started with a piece of pie. So Shelly keeps pushing Kathy down the hills in the back, the backyard. She's just pushing her down. So they've got a lot of land, right? So mm-hmm. she's just pushing her down these hills, kicking her in the stomach. The kids are running outside. Like, what's going on, right? So they're all staring. They're not stopping it because then they're going to get beat up. And she just keeps yelling at Kathy. Kathy, you know that you did it. No, I didn't do it. You know that I did it. Kathy, you just don't remember. Kathy, listen, you know I love you. I know, I know, and I love you too. Then you need to believe me when I tell you that you've been sleepwalking at night and I'm worried about you. I mean, of course you don't remember it, but Kathy, I found the meringue pie under your bed. I didn't put it there. Kids, did you put it there? And all the kids, they're saying, well, no, mother. And she says, well, then it must be you, Kathy. But I, I didn't do it, I swear, Shelly. Well, of course you did. But you did it while you were sleepwalking, so you don't remember. Now, the kids knew exactly what was going on because they had seen this being done. They had seen it later on, too. So Shelly would get on her hands and knees and stuff candy wrappers on Kathy's bed and then at the same time pretend to find it and say things like, oh, my God, Kathy, come here. You've been sleepwalking like a pig again. At night, you just get up, sleepwalk and eat all of our food. You eat like a pig. This has got to stop. And she did this so often that Kathy went from, there's no way I'm sleepwalking. I didn't do this. I don't even like pie to, okay, okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying. I'm tr- I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I don't remember any of this. I don't know what's going on with me. I'm sorry. So then eventually it escalated. The next claim was that Kathy walked butt naked into Shane's room while she was sleepwalking. And now Kathy is like, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. This is insane. What are you implying? No, I would never. Well, we all saw you, didn't you, Shane? And Shane said, yeah, he didn't. He knew this is a lie, but he was so terrified. So he said, yes. And Shelly said, Kathy, this has this has got to stop. You're you're a woman in your 30s. This is an underage teenage boy. This is illegal. I don't know what kind of feelings you have for him, but I just can't have that around here. So with that, she said, but that's okay. I'll fix you, Kathy. And she took away all of her privileges. So most of the personal stuff that Kathy had brought with her, her knitting kit, her books, her clothes, all of that was taken. The only thing she was left with was um, a single pair of undies and a long dress. Kathy was then forced to do chores around the house completely naked. She wasn't allowed to pee or shower without permission. And I think this completely naked is very confusing because she has kids around the house. She has Dave around the house. It just, it didn't make sense. Now, if Kathy needed to take a shower, it wasn't and in the bathroom she would take Kathy out to the backyard make her completely strip down nude hose her down with cold water and at this point she had been beaten by Shelly often so Kathy had a lot of sores she had a lot of blisters and she would Shelly would grab as soap bleach and pour bleach all over Kathy's open wounds her hair her face her eyes and said you filthy pig this will clean you up. And so Kathy was taking bleach showers in the backyard. And so every single day she says, you know, Kathy, you're a piece of shit. You're a piece of shit. You can't do anything right. And then eventually it seems like the kids and Kathy, they start believing these lies. This household went through so much bleach that they always had to buy another bottle every single grocery shopping trip, which I mean, if you guys have bleach at home, I I don't love bleach at home, but if you do, you buy it like, I don't even know, like once a year, maybe right yeah yeah, yeah. everyone's like no a lot more often you dirty hoe sorry okay i don't know right bleach is just intense later dave will say that he didn't know that bleach was harmful to the skin and he gives shelly the same excuse he says shelly would never have done that to kathy if she knew it was harmful So Dave is obsessed with Shelly, right? Are we getting this clear? He would even write a letter to Shelly that uh, people would find later that said, remember your words to me years ago? You once said that angels take themselves lightly. I'm married to an angel. Your eyes are the kindest eyes that I have ever seen. I thought he's trying to stay away from the house as much as he can. He's so scared of her, but he like believes that the sun shines out of her butt crack. Truly. 
I, I I don't know. I have trouble believing this because I he's know, trying to just, run away, or is he doing these gestures just so that she doesn't punish him as much? You know what I mean? Maybe, but I mean, it's gonna get even more confusing because he goes along with so much more stuff. So if Kathy didn't move fast enough while she's doing all of these chores, because I don't know, her blisters are full of bleach and she's dying, Shelly would force the kids to snap rubber bands at Kathy's naked body. Shane was forced to kick and punch Kathy. And if he didn't do it, if he disobeyed, Shelly would start duct taping Shane to the wall, like completely naked, just like duct tape him to the wall. And then these like sick, twisted, really strange games started happening. Shelly would lock Kathy into a closet. And then the kids would see her whispering through the door to Kathy saying, it's okay. You're going to be okay. I'm not going to let anyone hurt you. Kathy, I love you. I will always keep you safe. You're the one that just locked her in there. You're the one that just beat her up. What's going on? Sometimes she would force Kathy to stay inside of a closet the whole day. Then the kids get home from school and she says, Oh my God, I just noticed I haven't seen Kathy all day. So she would search with the kids room to room. And then finally, she would find Kathy, rip open that closet doors and say, Oh my God, are you hiding in here because you're scared of Shane? Come here, come here. I got you. Don't worry. Nobody is going to hurt you. It's like, I don't even understand her brain at this point. How does that even happen? So Kathy starts losing weight. She lost most of her teeth. Her hair had been chopped in this like frenzied bowl cut because Shelly would just snip, snip, snip wherever she wanted. And Kathy would go with them for all of their errands because they didn't want to leave her home alone. But because now she looks malnourished, she was forced to ride in the trunk and stay in the trunk while the family ran the rest of the errands. Sometimes these errands were just hours at the mall buying stuff and whenever anyone including kathy tried to run away it was usually shane or kathy that did the most running away the whole family would spend all day hunting them down in the car shelly was good at tracking people that's what everyone says she was like a hunter that is where she felt the most comfortable she was really good at finding out where people would go she would lure them in with fake promises, mainly being sweet, like, oh my God, uh, what are you doing behind that bush? Kathy, get over here. I thought you were gone. I thought something bad happened to you, sweetie. Oh my God, my heart is pounding. Come on, let's go home. And they would always fall for it. Now, the kids were starting to get worried about Kathy because it was apparent that something bad was happening to her. I mean, her physical appearance, she had lost over 100 pounds. She had no teeth left. It was really bad. So one night, they wake up in the middle of the night to hear some yelling outside. They look outside the window. The hills are covered with snow. And Kathy is being forced to run barefoot to the top of a hill where Dave is standing. And then Dave would just push her back down. She would tumble down the snowy hill and then she'd be forced to run back up for hours that this would happen so the next day the kids were kind of curious they went outside to where the hills were and there was just a trail of blood in the snow they were just torturing her they're just torturing her for fun at this point just for hours the minute that she gets to the top of the hill shelly would yell at dave to push her back down and then she would be like run run faster what are you doing she was also forced to write letters to her family saying that she's dating a trucker named Rocky. They're in love and I never want to come back to this shitty town. OK, I'm going to go find my romantic ending with this man. And the family, I mean, they believed her. They didn't even blame her because their family came from a really tough, rough background. And so they thought maybe this is her chance to get away. Maybe this is her chance to be the one of us that finds a happy ending. Eventually, Kathy would be moved so that she was sleeping outside in a building. Um, it was this tiny space. It's a four foot by four foot, really nasty wooden shed. And she'd be forced to sleep there just the whole time. You guys know that I'm always talking about function of beauty because of all the wonders that it's done to my hair, which honestly, if you haven't seen me on video, it's done wonders. My hair is so long now. It's got so much volume and it just feels very thick. It doesn't feel thin at all, which has been one of my biggest struggles. And now I'm here to talk to you about scent because it's summertime. Did you know scent is perhaps one of the most underrated of the senses? Like imagine it's summertime. You're thinking about, ooh, I want something to create memories and unleash my desire. Well, Function of Beauty's team, a formula scientist, know this, and they make scent a key ingredient in every bottle. I'm obsessed with all of their scents. They've got rose, pear, eucalyptus, and my absolute favorite, mango. It's not rotten. 
It's just pure, delightful mango. So if you guys have no idea about Function of Beauty, they are the world leader in fully customized hair care. They create your unique formula based on a short but thorough quiz to give your hair everything that it needs to look and feel its best. So every product that they have is sulfate and paraben free, vegan, cruelty free, and there are over 60,000 real five-star customer reviews. And one thing that all of the Function of Beauty fans are absolutely wild about are their fragrances. And for good reason, my hair has never smelled as amazing so they have tropical mango sweet peach crisp pear or settler scents like lavender rose eucalyptus and if you're like my mom and you're like oh i don't like fragrance you can get it unscented as well i look forward to my showers because once that shampoo hits i know that i'm like in a mango world filled with some of the most steamy mangoes that smell amazing so turn your beauty routine into an aromatherapy session a tropical getaway even go to functionofbeauty.com slash rotten to take your quiz and save 20% off of your first order. That applies to their full range of customized hair, skin, and body products. That's functionofbeauty.com slash rotten to let them know that you heard about it here and to get 20% off of your order. Functionofbeauty.com slash rotten. Now, during all of this, again, she's still going on with this whole cancer thing. Like, she's like, wow, I'm beating up all of my kids. I'm beating up Kathy, my best friend, and I still have cancer. What's going on? So Grandma Emily, she starts she starts deciding this is strange, okay? She's still getting cancer treatments. That doesn't make any sense. Why is she being so vague? I need to get to the bottom of this. So she decides to ambush her, a, a, a surprise attack. So she shows up at the house. She's knocking on the door. No answer. Knocks even louder. No answer. Finally, she gets an answer. Shelly opens the door and she's wearing a full face of completely white makeup all over her face. Like she just mm-hmm. put the whitest powder all over her face. She had shaved off her eyebrows and she says, oh my God, sorry. It took me so long to open the door. I'm just really sick. <laughs> she put on makeup to look sick? Yes the white makeup to look pale and sickly. And so they sit down in the living room. So Emily had brought um, Shelly's stepsister. So they're sitting there and they're like, well, how are you feeling? We just want to go over some medical bills. Wh- what doctor are you seeing? We want to talk to them because obviously you're not doing well. You know, maybe uh-huh. it's the doctor's fault. Maybe we need to get you to a second opinion, a second doctor. And she's like, oh, I'm just too sick to even, I can't even think about that hold on, I got to use the restroom. I think I'm going to throw up. So Shelly limps to the restroom and she comes back with a lock of hair and she says, my hair, my hair is just falling out. And so she hands it to Emily and she says, cancer is a bitch, huh? And Emily grabs it and she's looking at it. You know, Shelly, I think, I think you are going through something because it's strange. You know, I have never in my entire life seen people lose hair from cancer from the middle where are your roots <laughs> and she's looking at it and it looks like someone had just chopped in the middle of her head where are the damn roots shelly again it's like those five-year-old yes. behaviors like what yes. are you doing so then finally you know emily's like i'm gonna go use the restroom before we leave she goes into the restroom she inspects the trash can under a pile of tissues she finds a pair of scissors with clumps of red hair and there's red hair inside the scissors still so it's obvious that she just cut her hair in the middle of her head not even from the rope yet root or the scalp and she was like i just lost my hair so she brings out the scissors and she confronts shelly but shelly's like i don't know what you're talking about i have cancer (laughs) okay so one is why does she keep on insisting that she has cancer two is why does emily care because shelly wants to be the attention of everything Uh she wants everyone to feel bad for her she wants to be the center of everything you know and once she can't have that it's cancer again you know Mm -hmm. and i think emily cares because she cares a lot about her grandkids and she just feels like what's wrong with you okay like why are my grandkids living under this roof where they think that their mom is dying that's not healthy if you're not dying don't tell the kids that you're dying okay it's just you know It's just the strangest thing. So Emily's like, what the actual fork is going on? At one point, Nikki's high school, they were doing a dinner, a spaghetti dinner to raise money for one of Nikki's high school classmates whose parents has cancer. And when Shelly found out about this, she was so pissed. She was like, how come you don't do that for me? You don't want me at all, you disgusting little brat. So during this, you know, this woman with cancer, during her treatments, she needed some happiness, right? She needed something to take her mind off of her cancer. So she decides that her and her husband, Dave, are going to waterboard Kathy. 
they didn't understand the assignment completely so i don't know which one's more painful but instead of waterboarding her which is when you put like a towel over the um the victim's head honestly it's a victim okay and then you torture them by pouring a bucket of water onto the towel it feels like they're drowning but they're not really drowning so they're not gonna die right but they didn't understand that assignment so they just tied her up to a board and started pushing her head into a bucket full of water and legitimately drowned her over and over again for hours straight while yelling at kathy for being fat and worthless and so because kathy was fat Kathy's new diet was that she would only get to eat all the rotten food from the fridge, but she would have to do it with Shelly's making. So Shelly would blend them all together in a little smoothie maker. And it wasn't fruit. It was it was sometimes vegetables, sometimes moldy cheese, molded hamburger meat. And she would blend it into a smoothie and force Kathy to drink it and forced Kathy to tell her how delicious it was. She would sometimes force Kathy to swallow an entire cup of salt. And she would be vomiting the whole day because that, I don't even know what that can do to you, but not good. So yeah, she's like just swallowing cups of salt, just vomiting all day. And she had bruises everywhere. The kids would later say that it was like Kathy was one giant bruise. One day Dave comes home to see Kathy just back inside. She's allowed back inside now. And he hears this gurgling noise. So all of the girls, they had left to go to the mall. So Shelly with the kids are at the mall and it's just Dave and Shane at home. And he's like, what's that gurgling noise? Uh, I think that's just Kathy. So he goes over to Kathy and she is covered head to toe in like her own vomit. She's making this choking noise. He tried shaking her. And when he opened her mouth, there was vomit all in her nose and her mouth. He tried to perform CPR, but she remained unresponsive. Kathy was dead. So he calls Shelly and the girls to come back home immediately. And Shane tells Nikki, you know, Kathy's dead. So the kids, they start panicking. Shane and Nikki go check up on Kathy, and she really was dead. So the whole family, they hatch up this plan, right? The girls get into the car and they drive them to a motel. So now the daughters, they're forced to stay inside of this motel. Don't talk to anyone. Don't answer the door. The the rest of us are going to leave. So now Dave, Shane, and Shelly, they come back to the house and they burn Kathy's body in the backyard. It took close to eight hours. And Shelly kept saying, there's no reason to call the police. We are not going to let anyone tear this family apart so dave collected all of the ashes and the bones and he drove to wash away beach which is known for washing stuff away wash away beach and threw all of the ashes into the ocean that's it shelly continues to burn the rest of kathy's belongings and she asked shane and nikki to do some chores hey um that little fire pit over there we burned some insulation i need you guys to get little beats and little bits and pieces of the insulation out of there They knew what they were looking for. They grabbed their buckets and they were looking for parts of Kathy. And it took them days and they found the rest of her bones that had been like, you know, pretty much cut and stuff. Little bone fragments. And they brought them to Shelly. And that was it. They made Kathy completely disappear. So at this point, Shelly is now trying to cover up the hard part, which is, you know, Kathy's family, they're at one point, they're going to get concerned. They're going to be like, where's Kathy? What's going on? So she sat Nikki down and forced Nikki to study Kathy's handwriting and forge letters to the family saying, hey, I'm never coming back. I'm in love with Rocky. We're going to Hawaii together. See you never. Sayonara, bitches. And she pretty much wrote it. And she was like, okay, this is great. She ships off those letters. And then she starts doing one more thing. She was worried about one person in particular, Shane. And she kept saying, if you tell anyone, I will pin it all on you. I'll do it. I will tell them that you killed her. And he's like, what? I I promise I will never do something like that. But Shelly keeps going crazy. Anytime Shane was around, she would talk loudly about it. He's going to bring us all down. You guys know that, right? Don't be idiots. Shane's going to rat us out. It's only a matter of time. For over a year, just nonstop about Shane being paranoid about Kathy's murder. She hounded Dave at work, called him every single hour of every single day saying, Shane's going to turn us in. She's, he's going to ruin our family. You need to man up and do something about it. So finally, one day, Dave comes home. Shelly's an absolute wreck. And she says, I found these in the woodshed, Dave. Can you believe it? And she's holding up these bloody panties. What? They're Tories. Shane hid them in the woodshed. He's raping our baby. Tori? The youngest daughter. 
Oh my goodness. Now, obviously, the kids didn't believe a single word. I don't know about Dave because that night he beat the hell out of Shane that night. And then a few weeks later, Shane disappeared. He was gone. So like I said, normally this is, you know, Shelly's hunting season. She loves mm. hunting for these runaways. But this time in particular, instead of spending hours until they find Shane, which they did every single time that Shane ran away, they always found him. Shelly always tracked him down. Mm -hmm. They spent about an hour looking for him, which is unusual. And then Shelly said, well, we can't find him. Let's pack it up. Go back home. Oh, yeah. And then they just completely stopped looking. So now Nikki kept asking questions. When are we going to go look for Shane again? When are we going to go look again? And then a week later, she just, Shelly had a new story. Shane's doing fine. He called. He's in Alaska. He joined a fisherman's boat. That was his dream. That's what he's doing now. Don't worry about him. Super strange. So they didn't really believe this, but they kept thinking, okay, Shane is out there somewhere. He's a runaway. Maybe he is out there living a life now probably not in alaska but anything is better than here and they said that every time that they would go out they would scan the crowd for his face just in case at this point nikki and sammy are getting too old and she doesn't want them to talk to each other either she doesn't want this to be a repeat of shane and nikki so she would physically rip them off of each other if they even shared two words together these are sisters she wouldn't let them talk she would constantly tell sammy that nikki is the worst influence on her and she needs to stop talking to her so finally nikki's dream comes true this is when everything starts escalating into like what the fork so she gets admitted into a local college her dream you know this is her dream to finish her degree leave the house get a job anything any job is fine right mm -hmm. but slowly her mom starts ruining it took away all of her clothing except her yard work clothes because now she's the one doing all the yard work always smelly then she started forcing her to sleep on the floor where kathy used to sleep she took away all of her money all of her transportation and when she still wouldn't listen she said okay fine nikki you're gonna go live with your aunt for a few weeks that few weeks turned into a few months and nikki loved it there so Sammy knows, OK, well, Nikki's going to move with our aunt and uncle and she's probably staying there because, you know, it's for the best. She hates our family. Jody, on the other hand, felt completely abandoned by her older sister. So she wrote a note to Jesus because I think Jody was kind of seeing Nikki as her mom because her mom is weird. So maybe, you know, Nikki is like this constant, very calm figure that shows her nothing but love and is not just going to yell at her randomly for some small thing that she didn't do. So Jody writes a note to Jesus and says that I know Nikki is gone because mom is mean to her, but please bring her back. Her mom finds the note and starts beating her. And she tells Jody, this is like where the whole campaign starts. She tells Jody, your sister's evil. She beat me up. That's probably why I ended up getting cancer. Meanwhile, Nikki's just trying to get a life. She starts working at Baskin Robbins. Her second job, she starts doing um, the night shift at a motel. The motel even offered her a trailer to use. So she worked day in, day out, working nonstop. But she didn't mind it. I mean, nobody was calling her worthless. Nobody was hitting her. Hard work was nothing to her. She could do hard work. And so Dave, on the instructions of Shelly, was stalking Nikki nonstop, following his car, wearing shitty disguises, like fake mustaches that definitely... Yeah, that's you, Dave. We get it. He would throw a brick through her workplace window to cause a hassle in hopes that Baskin Robbins would be like, oh, God, ever since we hired this girl, shit's been happening. We got to fire her, right? They uh -huh. would call and say, hey, that person that you hired is evil. And they would just hang up like these anonymous tips to say that Nikki was the worst person ever. I mean, what? So because college ruined Shelly and Nikki's relationship, Shelly's now even more stressed because now it's about time that Sammy applies to college. So she's like, nope, I can't do this with my second kid. So she gets rid of all of her applications and makes sure that they aren't turned in on time. No. And again, this was Sammy's dream too. So Sammy runs away and she stays with Grandma Emily for a while. So finally, after a year of being separated, the two oldest sisters with Grandma Emily are reunited. And they said that there was so much emotion. So Nikki was about 22 years old and she had never looked prettier or happier. She was wearing jeans. She was wearing like fitted clothing. She had makeup on and she outgrew that weird chopped bull haircut from the mom. I mean, she was beautiful. She was confident. And so she was like, wow, this is not even who I thought my sister was. Like, this is insane. <laughs> and so finally, Sammy starts bargaining with Shelly, right? Nikki's doing her own thing. Okay. She's working and Sammy's like, I still want to go to college. So she bargains with her mom and says, if you pay for my college and you resubmit my applications, I will move back in with you. 
I will remain in contact with you. I will still stay at my dorms on the weekdays, but I'll still remain in contact with you. I will not live with Grandma Emily because Shelly was so jealous that she was with Grandma Emily, right? And Shelly was, she was spiraling at this point. She was tens of thousands of dollars in debt. She had lupus. She had ovarian cancer. She had, I don't know, 20 other diagnoses of cancer. Nikki refuses to come back home. Sammy's at college that they're paying for and nothing's working. So Tori became her newest place to take out her frustration. So once a month, she would yell at Tori to get downstairs into the living room and take off all of her clothes. This is what she called puberty checks. Time to check your progress. Forced to take off all of her clothes. And if she didn't, she would say things like, why not? You think your mom's perverted or something? Take it off. And then she would examine her breasts and and then examine her vagina. And then she had a strange request. She said, Tori, I need a lock of your pubic hair for your baby book. What? My pubic hair? No, mom, what? No, nobody does that. What's wrong with you? Well, your sisters did it for me. Why do you, uh, Tori, why do you always have to be so difficult? Just give me a lock of your pubic hair. It's not that bad. Mom, that's, that's weird. You think it's creepy? There's nothing wrong with the human body. And if you think there is, then there's something seriously wrong with you. So the mom hands her a pair of scissors and she walks into the bathroom and she's like, "Okay, let me just get it over with. And she snips out a lock of her hair, walks back out, super embarrassed. And she's handing it to her mom and she doesn't want to make eye contact. She's like, just Mm -hmm. take it. What the fuck? Right. And her mom isn't looking at her. So she looks at her mom and Shelly starts laughing. And she looks disgusted and she says, oh, God, I don't want that. I just wanted to see if I could make you do it. And just continues laughing. You're just shaking your head. (laughs) Whenever they would be cleaning, um, the mom would force Tori to stuff things into her underwear. Like she would just hand her garbage and be like, put that in your underwear, you little shit. That's literally what she would say. And so she would stuff like dirty newspapers into her underwear. And it was just the most confusing type of punishment and torture. She would force Tori to do yard work, but she would say, first, unzip your pants. So Tori would unzip her pants and she would place an axe inside of her pant leg. So just like, you know, you're like loose pajama bottoms. Imagine Uh an axe in one of those leg compartments. So she would be limping, careful not to cut herself. But I'm assuming that's inevitable. She'd probably cut herself a lot with that axe. And her mom would make her do all this heavy yard work. And she would do it with an axe in her pants. None of this is making sense. I have never researched torture like this before. It's like, maybe it's not the most gruesome or the most grotesque, but it's it's bizarre it's and psychological. it's psychological. Yeah, really psychological and bizarre. And like, who even comes up with stuff like this? Yeah. If Tori ever pissed off her mom, she would get into bed and see all of the kitchen trash, bathroom trash, all under her blanket. And she would freak out. Sometimes her mom would force her to take off her underwear and she would sprinkle disinfectant powder onto her underwear. And Tori would scream that it burned and that it hurt, but she would just say, this is how it, you have to get clean. This All girls do it. This is how you clean your vagina. If Tori forgets to clean the dog kennel for the dog, her mom would force her to crawl inside the dog cage with all of the poop. And then she would turn on the hose and keep spraying the inside of the kennel. So it was a tornado of cold water and dog feces and urine and Tori trapped inside of there. So around this time, you know, Shelly starts having to do some yard work and she's not a fan of this. All of the rest of her kids are gone. Nikki has run away. She's working now. She's doing her own things. Sammy's in college, doesn't have time to come home and visit her poor mother anymore. And Tori, she's too young to be doing any substantial yard work. I don't know why they have so much yard work, to be honest. It's not like they were like running a farm or anything. They just, she was just like, you need to do all this yard work. So she decides to befriend someone by the name of ron woodworth and he was going through a difficult time he had just recently gotten fired and evicted and had nowhere to go his partner had just abandoned him so he had heartbreak mixed in with all of this and he just he was really sad and shelly became his friend and she said why don't you come live with me you know you could do some work around the house and it would be nice to have a man at home because dave is never home anymore and you could just um you could just do some yard work. Yeah, that's it. That'll be fun. So Ron Woodworth starts living with the family. Dave comes home one day and there's a man living in their house. And he's like, uh, what is this, Shelly? And she just says, oh, that's my friend. He's gay. And that was that. 
so he was like, okay, so I guess he's living here now. I mean, I just, what, what is going on? So of course, you know exactly where this story goes. He starts doing work around the house. Then he's not allowed to leave the house. Then he's not allowed to have a bed. Then he's not allowed to use the restroom. And then he's not allowed to have shoes. They would only feed him toast, water, and pills. Pills to like sedate him. And he just, he lost himself. He was forced to drink his own pee all the time. Oh my God. One of my biggest habits that I would do all the time before I found Grammarly was I would send out an email, sometimes a professional email, sometimes an informal, friendly, catching up email. And afterwards, I would sit there and I would ponder for the next 20 minutes. Do you think that they're going to take it the wrong way? Do you think that, um, am I being too informal? Is this professional enough? Wait a minute. Did I spell everything correctly? Am I grammatically correct? Are they going to think I'm an idiot? <laughs> I would just nonstop think about this. But now it's so much easier to write clearly and confidently because I get real time feedback and guidance on tone, word choice, clarity, and more with Grammarly Premium. Let me tell you, Grammarly Premium has kind of changed my life, truly. It has elevated my writing. So they have these cool things called clarity suggestions which help me write clearer, more concise, you know, sentences without unnecessary or redundant words. They also have things like vocabulary suggestions. So whenever you overuse words and phrases, it just kind of loses the reader, whether that's your professor or your boss or your coworker, they're just less engaged because it's always the same overused words. It's not powerful anymore, but with their vocabulary suggestions, it makes it more exciting, effective, and memorable. Grammarly has really helped in making communicating so much easier because I know that my writing is saying exactly how I feel and exactly what I want to come across, which is an amazing feeling. And the cool thing is I've noticed that it doesn't just correct my mistakes, but it helps me build up my skills as a writer with advanced suggestions. Harness the power of Grammarly on every platform, whether it's your desktop editor, browser plugin, truly it works everywhere, like mobile apps, Outlook, Gmail, Twitter, LinkedIn, and more. So don't just say it, make a statement. I wish that I could put this into my brain. Imagine how amazing that would be. Do more than just spell check. Say what you really mean with Grammarly Premium. Get 20% off of Grammarly Premium by signing up at Grammarly.com slash Rotten Mango. That's 20% off at G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash Rotten Mango. So Nikki goes to visit her grandma, Emily, on the other side of town, right? Nikki is doing, doing all of this work stuff. Finally, she has time. She's like, Grandma, I'm coming over. They start watching a crime show that night. So she's spending the night, right? And it was, I mean, there was just, things got weird. The grandma, Grandma Emily said there was some tension building inside of Nikki while they were watching this show. And she didn't think anything of it. Maybe it was the long drive or, you know, whatever it may be. Kids are weird. The next morning, Nikki breaks down completely. And she's weeping and she's sobbing and she says, Grandma, Shelly and Dad killed Kathy. What? So immediately, Grandma Emily is like, okay, you, what? You, you have to tell me everything. And she's like, I think they killed Shane too. And so immediately... She gets on the phone. Grandma Emily gets on the phone, calls two different police stations, the one in their jurisdiction and the one that Shelly's house would be in. Right. And mm -hmm. they all say, OK, here's a fax number. Turn in your official statement. They fax it in. No response. Nothing. You would think that there would be a response. Imagine faxing into a police station that you think that you have a murderer on your hands. Right. Nothing. So Nikki goes to the police station. She makes a full statement and lets them know that there is someone else living in the house. Now, there's some dude named Ron. Same thing is probably going to happen to him. And my little sister is in that house and we need to do something. They're all going to get hurt. And they said, OK, we'll do something. And she left that police station thinking, Holy shit. She, like she was nervous. She was tingling and she said something big is about to happen. Our lives as we know it is about to change because this this is about to blow up. This is this is going to be crazy. Like my mom is going to be in prison. I don't even know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And then absolutely nothing happened. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing Why? happened. They don't check up on it. They don't really care. The police are like, "Yeah, yeah, sure, sure." And they just didn't really investigate. So Nikki did the most that she could, but the police wouldn't investigate. So she just kind of moves on with her life. And this is where it gets crazy. You know, Nikki gets married. 
Yeah, she starts trying to live a life that she always felt was impossible. So, I mean, it's nice to see that she wasn't living with this. I'm sure to a degree she was, but she wasn't letting this torment and the trauma get with her. Right. So she gets married. She has a wedding. Sammy goes to the wedding. Her mom obviously wasn't invited. But um, yeah, beautiful moment. Anyways, back to Shelly. Things are really getting messed up in the Shelly household. Ron, he's barefoot doing all of these crazy things. They really started amping up the torture for Ron. They would have him jump off of the roof of their house over and over and over again onto his bare feet. What? Um, I don't get these. His legs would be, if not, they would be sprained, if not broken, and he would continue to jump. And then immediately after, they would shove him into a bath of hot, burning water mixed with bleach. And Tori said this was the worst smell she had ever smelt. It's the smell of bleach and decomposing flesh. It's literally the smell that he's burning his skin off and then the smell of that skin dying, like dying flesh. And Ron smelt like that for the next month. Shelly would boil water and just pour it over his feet. His skin would melt off. So at this point, I think everyone knew that this was going to be a Kathy 2.0 situation. He wasn't going to make it. Even if he went to a hospital, I think it would take a lot of work and a lot of time to get him to be healthy again. He had lost all of his teeth as well. He had pretty much no hair. He had lost weight. And then one morning, Tori wakes up and he's gone. And she's like, well, where's Ron, mom? Oh, oh, he's just at another friend's house healing. I am going to go every single day to take care of him, but he's going to get better at the friend's house. But Tori, you can't tell anyone about him. You know that, right? Yeah. Okay, mom. So then out of nowhere, Shelly wants Tori to go stay with Sammy. She's like, go stay with your older sister on college campus. You haven't seen her in a while. So Tori, I mean, she has no idea why her mom wants her gone. She's like super stoked. She's like, yes, I haven't seen Sammy. So she meets up with Sammy and Sammy is like, okay, get ready. We're going to have the best weekend. Two things are going to happen. First, I'm going to make you eat sushi for the first time. And she's like, oh, I don't want sushi. That sounds nasty. Second, we're going to go see Nikki. Now, Tori had been brainwashed for years into thinking that Nikki was literally the devil and mm-hmm. terrified. She's like, I don't I don't want to see her. No, I'm not going to see her. And she was like, no, you have to see her. We're just going to have lunch. OK, it's going to be fine. So finally, after years, they are reunited. Nikki is now 28 years old. She's married. You know, she's moving on with her life. Mm-hmm. And Tori said that Nikki was the most beautiful woman she had ever laid her eyes on. She was poised. She was beautiful. She even smelled wonderful. And this was like the biggest deal in Tori's life, seeing her sister again after all of these years. And she said that once she saw Nikki, any feeling that her mom was right just disappeared because she knew that Nikki loved her. Like she felt it. She was like, my sister loves me. This is crazy. No. So the real reason that Shelly wanted her gone was so that her and Dave could, you guessed it, dispose of Ron's body. He was dead, you know? Dave needed to come and help. She had stuffed Ron's body into the freezer, and finally, you know, Dave's coming back, but they have this huge problem. There was a burn ban because of all of the national fires that were happening, the wildfires that were happening. You can't start a fire. You will literally have the cops called on you, even if you have, like, a little fire pit. So he's like, what do I do? So instead, he decides to dig a giant grave in the backyard. This was going to be a temporary solution. He would have to burn his body later when the ban was gone now at this point a lot of investigators asked dave why this is the second time okay maybe the first time we can kind of believe i mean you're still going to be charged but like we can kind of believe that you thought the best for, the, for kathy and your wife and your family but the second time what, <laughs> the second time and he said i love her dearly there is no way shelly would have caused any abuse on ron or kathy she just didn't call 911 when ron passed away it was just out of fear of what happened in the past Like I said, my wife worries about everything and she was just looking out for her family again. She's just always being the protector that she is. I don't see where she had done anything wrong. (laughs) Yeah, I too don't see the wrong in forcing my friends to jump off of my roof until they break their limbs. I think he's evil. Let's be honest. Like, I yes, there's brainwashing. There's all of that. But he's evil. He pushed the other person down the hill 
because he was yelled at. I know. What? The, what I you, know. What? I don't. I mean, come on. So like, yes, to, I I be I believe he's totally brainwashed. But either way, yeah. and the things that they've done to their kids, there's no excuse. You're a grown ass man. Like, yeah, you're supposed to protect your kids. So I agree. The book, um, they did interview Dave for the book. Uh -huh. So the book is very lenient on Dave in the sense of they think that he is just um, kind of like hopelessly in love, but also hopelessly clueless of a guy. I've never <laughs> seen someone hopelessly in love to a point that just and terrified Mur and tortured victim, yeah. murder so many people and did all the things that they did to their kids come on but okay sorry devil's avocado would we feel the same way if dave was the woman if dave was the wife yes i did because i i totally shit on even yes. elizabeth fritzel's mom yes, yes. the yeah. fact that just okay. the moment you say that they used to make their kids strip naked oh, yeah, and do these weird. crazy things and he's just on the side watching yeah and didn't do anything about it just that alone forget about all the other tortures yeah <sighs> come on you're right so that's what he said about it. I don't see where she had done any wrong. So, I mean, <laughs> I think that sentence says enough. So after this reunion that the sisters had, Tori is so happy. This was the best thing ever. So she gets back to Sammy's dorm and they're just talking. They're folding laundry. They're talking. They're like, oh, my God, how is it like seeing Nikki and all of that? And so they start talking and Sammy says, you know, there was this one time where mom used to wake me up in the middle of the night and she would just dump out all of my laundry onto the bed at like three in the morning, just screaming at me because she thought that I had misplaced a sock. And if I didn't find that sock, I wasn't being I wasn't able to go back to sleep. And oh, my God, it was such a shit show. And that's when Tori says, oh, yeah, she does that to me, too. And everything freezes. For whatever reason, the two older sisters never saw abuse on Tori in the house. At this point, they had all left the house or they weren't home when the physical abuse towards Tori started happening. They mm. knew that Tori would be yelled at, but they always thought maybe the young one is not being hit. You know, maybe she is kind of like the gem of the family. She's kind of like Shelly's little, little, little doll, right? Yeah, maybe they just didn't really think yeah. about it, right? And so she's like frozen and she's like, what? She did that to you? Okay, Tori, tell me everything she did to you. And so Tori starts telling her everything. I mean, the whole puberty checks, the disinfectant in her underwear, all of that. And they're both just in tears. And finally, they get to the subject of Ron. And she says, okay, Tori, is she doing that to him too? And she's like, yes. So Tori was too young to remember Kathy that well, right? And so immediately Sammy calls Nikki and Nikki's like, oh my God, she's learning all of this information. And Sammy and Nikki come to the conclusion that mom killed not only Kathy, probably Shane, and is probably going to kill Ron too. So they all start freaking out. Now at this point, Tori still has to go home. She's terrified. After all of this conversation, now she's even more scared. So the two sisters, they promise her, we're gonna get you out of there. Don't worry. But you still have to go home. So she goes home with her mom and she acts like nothing's wrong. And she's like, yeah, I had fun. Like I'm just tired, right? And the two older sisters, they drive to a police station. And this time, they said they would not leave until the police do something. And they told them everything from the beginning. All of the abuse, everything. Thing. And then at the end, Nikki looks at the same sheriff in the eye and says, if Ron is dead, you could have stopped it. Oof. And so the next morning, a knock came at the door at Shelly's house. And it was the police, but they weren't here for Shelly. They were here for Tori. It was uh, with CPS. She was going to be taken away for suspected child abuse. And Shelly was not being arrested yet. So Shelly, I mean, she starts freaking out. She's calling everyone. She's calling Nikki, Sammy, everyone, demanding who told, who, who did what, what's going on. Everyone's denying it. And she's screaming at everyone, bloody murder. Don't you dare talk to the police. Don't do shit. Right. And they're like, OK, like, calm down. Now, the police were concerned that they didn't have enough to arrest Shelly shelly maybe for child abuse but they wanted her for murder so they kept trying to think of a way but then all of a sudden they were they were hitting a roadblock they didn't know what to do right in walks in dave hey dave what are you doing here um shelly told me to come here because we don't know where you guys are keeping tori and she wants to see tori okay yeah we'll tell you where tori is why don't you come sit down in this interrogation room real quick 
um we just want to ask have you a chat. <laughs> let's have a chat yeah buddy to buddy let's have a chat do you want some coffee you want some water <laughs> so he sits down in the interrogation room and almost immediately they're like hey we know that ron is probably dead mm-hmm. and he confesses he starts crying and he confesses to where ron's body is and where the remains are and so they press on a little bit more and they say well what about shane where did he go do you know if he ran away And he says, he's not missing. (laughs) She kept yelling at me that Shane was going to take the girls away. She kept saying things to Dave like, you need to fucking man up, grow a pair. What kind of man are you? Do you realize what's at stake here? Do you want him to go and tell and then ruin all of our lives? And so one night I grabbed my gun and I shot him in the back of his head when he was asleep. So after he shoots Shane, in the back of the head, he runs to Shelly and he says, oh my God, oh my God, I did it. And guess what Shelly's reaction is? Why? You killed our nephew? Why would you do something like that? What the heck, oh Dave? God, how classic. What are we going to do now? Why would you kill our nephew? <sighs> I guess we just have to do the same thing that we did with Kathy. So they burned his body and they took his ashes out to Washaway Beach. So at this point, both of the parents are arrested. Sammy, who is now 25 years old, was given guardianship over Tori. Dave, um, February of 2004, he pled guilty for second degree murder of Shane Watson, pled guilty to unlawful disposal of human remains and rendering criminal assistance. And his sentence was 15 years in prison. So he's a free man now. And Shelly, because there was no body for Kathy, the autopsy for Ron, they dug up his body. They couldn't determine which injury killed him, which is that not crazy? Is that not insane? Okay. They couldn't determine was it this or was it that? And if they can't determine that, they can't determine who inflicted that injury. And then they can't determine who's the murderer. That's mind blowing to me. So she ended up taking an Alfred plea. The Alfred plea is interesting because you pretty much plead guilty, but you also say that you're innocent at the same time. It's just saying, hey, I understand that the court has enough to convict me, but I'm not saying that I did it. It's almost like you're pleading guilty, but you're saving your face, right? So both sides, they agree that she was going to be sentenced to 17 years. Now at the sentencing, she's in front of a judge and she says she gives her a little speech. She says, in this jail and in this courtroom and in this community and everywhere else, I am known as some horrible monster, but I'm not. I've made horrible mistakes, though. You got to love it when apologies do this, okay? Kathy was my friend. She had value and she had purpose and she would have been there for me and I wasn't there for her. I was not there when Kathy died. I wasn't there for her. I believe I'm not guilty of murder or deliberately causing her death. But as a mother, I am responsible for my home environment. And she was mistreated in my home by Shane and Nikki. And now she's gone. And I'll never get over it. And I don't deserve to. So the judge listens to this and he uh, the judge hated the speech and they threw the book at her, which means that when they agree that when you plead guilty, the prosecutor is saying, hey, we're going to ask the judge for 17 years and you agree. Okay, you're going to ask the judge for 17 years, but the judge can give you the maximum sentence if they want. So the judge says, no, I'm going to throw the book at you and added five more years. I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but maybe it is. So you're saying that her little speech speech pissed him off. Pissed him off. He was like, (laughs) what are you talking about? You know, like you were. But still, she only got what, 20? 22 years. That's nothing. Yeah. She was sentenced to 22 years in prison for the second degree murder of Kathy and a manslaughter charge for Ron's death. And Dave was released in 2016. He feels a lot of remorse. He says that he thinks about Shane every day. He still works day in, day out. He keeps in touch with Sammy and Tori, but Nikki refuses to see him. And he understands. So Shelly will be released next year in 2022. She will be 68 years old and she still refuses to accept any of her charges. She says that this is a big mistake on the prosecutor's part. She also claims that she has cancer in prison. 
So the sisters, the No Tech sisters, I mean, they they mainly talk to Greg Olson, who is a true crime author. He also has a lot of really good fiction books. They talk to him because she's going to be released soon, and they think that she is still a danger to society. I think she's so going to manipulate people. She's going to kill people, whether for money, whether for what. She's still a danger. Now, Nikki in life, she's doing really well. She's living, um, I believe, in Seattle in a million-dollar house. She is married. She's got beautiful children. She has this successful business. And Sammy, she still lives in her hometown, and she's an elementary school teacher. She also has children of her own, and she still has that humor that everyone loves about her. And Tori, she's in her 30s, and she is absolutely beautiful and brilliant. She works in, um, I believe she does social media for a hospitality yeah mm. she's like a not like a not like an influencer she's like a manager like a like a full-on like a real social media person yeah mm. yeah and um they said that a lot of them even when they go to the grocery store they still can't smell bleach they can't look at bleach they avoid it they don't really like looking at duct tape or any of these things because it just brings them back to a weird place now, the reason that people suspect that Shelley is possibly a serial killer is because, well, I mean, the same reason that people think Charles Manson is a serial killer, right? Because she had facilitated all of these deaths, right? So there's Kathy, there's Shane, there's Ron. And also, Shelley had actually taken up side work taking care of an elderly man named Mac. I mean, he was elderly, but he mysteriously died and he left his entire house to Shelley. So that is another possibility that there mm. might have been more victims than we know of. And I think if she gets out, well, when she gets out, because she is getting out, it's not like it's parole. That's mm -hmm. her release date. I think she's going to be a danger to society. Yeah. And I think it's going to be the most unexpected danger. Not a lot of people know about her yet. Yeah. And she is, you know, a nice looking grandma. Exactly. She's going to be the next Nanny Doss. The giggling yeah, granny. That's yeah. exactly what I'm thinking. She's going to get out and she's going to be like, this is my new career. Yeah, she can get away with so much. Yeah. Wow. So if you guys live on the West Coast, be on the lookout. And I hope you guys enjoyed today's story. Let me know. What are your thoughts on this? And do you think that, I mean, this is one of those things where the story builds it up. And then, and then 22 years, you're like, what? This is the most unsatisfying, annoying, how? What are your thoughts? And I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you guys on Sunday for the mini-sode. Bye.